autism was first described in 1943. It was seen as an extremely rare condition affecting very, very few children. We now know that autism is not all that very rare and right now approximately 1 in 100 people are thought to have autism. Initially, most researchers focused on the psychological aspects of autism. But then in 1980s and 1990s, genetics came into play. What genes contributed to risk for autism and how these genes could be identified. Then in 2000s, there were two big major revolutions in the field of human genetics. One is in 2003 where the Human Genome Project was completed. And subsequently, what this also did was that it made genetic technologies a lot cheaper. Since 2010, we have had a whole host of studies which have identified a lot of genes uh, that contribute to risk for developing autism. So I grew up in southern India. For the longest time I wanted to be a herpetologist, uh, but then at some point I decided that I was more interested in neurosciences and genetics. I joined the Autism Research Centre in Cambridge to do an MPhil and continued that to do a PhD on the genetics of autism. I had a friend who was doing her PhD in St John's and when I was applying to Cambridge uh, I reached out to her and asked her you know, which college should I apply to and without hesitation she said you should apply to St John's. St. John's has been extremely supportive. They are funding my PhD um, and the very fact that you know they can provide you with accommodation throughout your PhD has been fantastic. So my PhD essentially looks at the genetics of autism and the way we look at it is not through defining autism as a clinical condition but we are interested in genetics of cognitive and non-cognitive traits that are associated with autism. So when we think of genetic variants, genetic variants can occur in all sizes, shapes and forms. But then you can also have these small typographical errors. So globally, across all human beings, we have anywhere between 30 to 40,000 of these typographical errors, which we call SNPs, which stand for single nucleotide polymorphisms. And when we think about it, SNPs form the basic background on which other genetic mutations act. So they can modify the effect of other genetic mutations. So by focusing on these SNPs or the genetic background and seeing how they are associated with all these different traits, we can then see how do these SNPs together contribute to these traits and how they affect uh, other mutations. DNA can be collected from practically any cell in the human body. Usually people collect DNA um, from blood. But the problem with this is that you can't really get blood samples from a lot and lot of individuals essentially. So quite recently uh, we've been going about collecting DNA from saliva uh, and this is quite cool. The, the, the basic way you can do this is to post a saliva kit which is essentially a tube filled with a bit of liquid and um, send, them, send it to various people, have them spit into the tube and once they close the cap of the tube you can extract DNA from the saliva, from the cells that are found in the saliva. One study which I was involved in was looking at the effect of these SNPs on something known as cognitive empathy. So cognitive empathy is the ability to identify someone else's emotions and mental states. And this is an area where individuals with autism often have difficulties. So this is the reading the mind in the eyes test and it's a short test of how well you can recognize emotions. Um, we can measure cognitive empathy using a test known as the reading the mind in the eyes test. People are shown photographs of actors' eye regions and the actors in these photographs are portraying very specific emotions. Uh, next to these photographs are four words which describe various emotions and the challenge is to match the word that describes the emotion that's being portrayed in the photograph. Let me know, I'll explain the results. Good luck. And we can then go ahead and match each individual's genetic information to their scores on the test and then run the same experiment in large populations. So once we get the data, the challenge again is to map each individual genetic variant to the score um, at a population level. 
uh, and we are looking at uh, tens of millions of SNPs essentially. Um, so for each SNP we run what is known as a regression model which is a standard statistical model um, and from the regression model we get uh, a statistical significance that is how likely is it that the SNP will contribute to the phenotype that's being tested. This is a score on the ICE test and as you can see you have done very well. Um, on average individuals with autism have strengths and difficulties in a number of domains. For example many individuals find it difficult to socially interact with other human beings without autism but equally individuals with autism can also be extremely talented um, in areas of science, technology, engineering and mathematics. We are looking at the genetics of all these traits, traits like emotion recognition, cognitive ability, aptitude in science, technology, engineering and mathematics and we are trying to sort of dissect the genetics of these traits and use that to understand the underlying biology of autism and where the risk lies in all these traits.